Hello and a very good afternoon to this afternoon's debate that's the Centre for Countering Digital Hate is organising for us today. We're going to be talking about using the DSA to counter disinformation and save lives. So really getting into some of the nitty gritty with practical examples about the Digital Services Act. We're going to be focusing a little bit on the anti-vax sort of campaigns that have been going on. We're going to look at that because it is very topical and it comes with really good concrete examples that we can draw on for our discussion. Now I can see attendees are still joining, so I want to encourage everyone to get involved. My name is Jennifer Baker. I'm going to be your moderator today. So my main job is just to try and facilitate the discussion and get everyone heard. And so please do feel free to use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen to ask questions of our panelists. Let's keep the chat for a chat, but let's have the panelists questions going into that Q&A box. If you can be concise, that would be great and really helpful and make my life easier. And also, if you can indicate to which panelist your question is aimed, if it's to all panelists, feel free to say that as well. We really do want to try and get everyone talking about this, really getting into depth. We're only here for a, a short enough amount of time, so I won't delay any longer. I will introduce our speakers. Uh, joining us from the European Parliament, we have the IMCO Committee DSA Shadow Rapporteur, Alexander Reis. Thank you very much, Alexander. Lovely to see you. We also have Barbara Bach, who is the co-founder and president of the Vienna Vaccine Safety Initiative. Thank you for joining, Barbara. Lovely to see you. And last but not least, we have Imran Ahmed, the CEO from the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, who, of course, organised today's event. If you've joined us, I presume it's because you do know about them. But if not, take a run over online to counterhate.com if you want to learn more. Today's event is being recorded, so don't worry if you miss something, but please do stay with us until the end and keep your questions coming in from the beginning. With that, I'm going to hand over straight away to Alexandra to give us her opening thoughts about why you think it's important to be talking about this at this stage, because the DSA is still quite some way from being finalised. So tell me your perspective on what we need to be looking at at this point in proceedings. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you very much um, for having me and a good good afternoon. Yeah, we can say afternoon. Good after, afternoon to, to everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to make the point that the Digital Services Act actually doesn't even mention disinformation. And I think this is very important because we all have the impression that disinformation is one of the major issues we are having in the digital world. But the Digital Services Act is not specifically addressing it because the DSA focuses on procedures for, among other things, for illegal content. And a lot of the misinformation and disinformation is not actually clearly illegal. And that is, I think, one of the first problems we need to address. Uh, the DSA does mention uh, terms of service, which um, for the major platform usually exclude um, false or misleading information. But we all know that these policies are not consistently enforced. And the the Commission so far, and the legislator as well as in the European Parliament, is quite reluctant to step in there. I think we should have a provision requiring terms of services, especially of the very large online platforms who have a specific chapter within the DSA, to um, have their terms of service based on international human rights standards and also to be enforced coherently. But how far we really want to step in there is still unclear. I think what is more interesting about the DSA is indirect or the indirect ways to tackle disinformation. And one indirect way would be to have more transparency on recommender systems. Recommender systems are systems used especially by, by major platforms. Um, you all know probably uh, YouTube's autoplay. So you start to watch one video and then it goes on to the next and the next and the next. And what has been quite often observed um, is that you start with something absolutely trivial and easy and some very precise information. Um, for example, on vaccines, you just want to figure out how to vaccine your child and then you, you just let it run. And at the third, the fourth, the fifth or the tenth video, you get a lot of disinformation. You get, you get anti-vax information without even looking for it specifically. 
And that is an example of a recommender system being very, really detrimental. This is also a huge issue on Facebook. Um, we know, for example, that in Germany, one third of Facebook groups are, have extremist content. And 64% of the members of those groups have joined those groups upon the recommendation of Facebook itself. And I think this is, this is a very, very serious issue that we need to address. We need to find out how these recommender systems work. And I think the platforms really have to open up their data, give access to academia in order for us as a society to have the possibility to reflect on this and to decide whether we want to further regulate. I do think we have even more, an even stronger leverage because what is really driving this tendency towards disinformation and towards what I would, with a general term, summarize as polarizing content, which disinformation is a part of, um, but also hateful speech, is the business model underlying these platforms. These platforms basically um, make revenue on advertising. And on advertising, that is very different from the advertising we know from TV or from our traditional media outlets, which traditionally until 20 years ago, an advertisement um, would be placed within a certain context. So if you wanna sell a car, um, you probably put it on a magazine that people read who are trying to choose a car or interested into that kind of, of sport, for example. Um, today, platforms collect huge amounts of data on everybody of us and create micro profiles and then um, show us content and advertising and ads based on those profiles. So everybody of us has lives in a different di di digital world and sees different ads. Um, that also means that um, we don't know what other people see, but it means that the platforms have an extremely strong incentive to keep us on the platforms as long as possible, which means um, giving us polarizing content and content that polarizes us specifically. Because the more we stay, the more we engage and the more emotional that content is and emotional for people usually means negative emotions because positive emotions are great. Uh, cat pictures, um, but negative emotions um, push us to stay on the platform and to interact with the content. And this is unfortunately human psychology with these, which these platforms use very efficiently. So anger, hate, fear are the main emotions that platforms try to elicit in us. And that happens with a lot of stiff information. Tell people that a vaccine is going to kill their children and they will try to inquire what's going on. Um, the same thing as hateful speech, and it has been shown that especially Facebook uses um, information on the same cause or pushes information going into completely different directions in order to sort of pit up groups of people against each other because they will both um, stay on the platform more and engage more with the content. So that works especially well because the platforms have all that huge amount of data, so they do know what is targeted specifically to us and what is going to enrage me rather than someone else, which is going to be very different. So it's different from a traditional um, sort of um, the low cost journalism that used to do that, um, tabloid journalism uses the same system, but it only works on part of the population. It doesn't work for everybody because we don't get triggered. Not everybody gets triggered by the same content, but in the internet, we all get the content that triggers us. Additionally, this works on the basis of click rates, which are then communicated to on performance, which is then communicated um, to advertisers and advertising clients. And there's a huge issue in this sector, which is called advertising fraud. Um, that means that there are websites being set up only um, with the only aim to attract clicks. And that is very often disinformation and misinformation. So this has really become a, a, a business for the people putting misinformation or disinformation in the internet because it's, been, it's become an option to make a lot of money. And this means also that um, prestigious traditional brands 
are financing this information because the programmatic exchange system, which is very complicated to explain, I can't do that in my few minutes, um, doesn't give them any control over the websites where the ads are placed. So you will have companies which have certain values and don't want their ads to be financing disinformation that are against their will strongly financing misinformation or disinformation. So that's another problem. And I can go more into that. So what we can do in the DSA, the commission has asked for transparency of the advertising market, the online personal advertising market. I think that's definitely not enough because it's so complicated that meaning meaningful transparency is very, very difficult to achieve. Um, the rapporteur who has published her report yesterday, the report we are going to amend now in the next four weeks, calls for an opt-in. So um, all users would to be sort of opted out, it would not be activated, the personal advertising, we would have to opt in proactively. And my group thinks this is still not enough, we just should have a ban for that kind of personalized advertising that uses all that amount of data that funds this information. So this is something very meaningful we could do within the DSA. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I saw, um, maybe on the audits um, there is there is an article on risk assessments. So companies have to do their own risk assessments, especially on how their um, their work affects um, fundamental rights. And there are independent audits already planned within uh, within the DSA, but nobody can say very clearly who is going to do those audits and who is going to decide what the object of these audits is exactly going to be. And we are advocating, or I'm advocating strongly for um, including the risk of disinformation in the risk assessments, and especially for having an independent European agency that would supervise that auditing process, because I don't think private oversight is enough for the DSA, considering the tech giants we are dealing with. I think we, we have a very strong public interest here in having public oversight, and that is something else that the DSA could achieve. And I think all of these measures taken together would take out the financial incentive to spread disinformation, which I think is huge because disinformation has always existed, but the fact that it's exploded so much in the past years can really be explained at least partly um, with the financial incentives offered by, by tech giants and the way social networks work right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Really comprehensive background look at the, the business model problems that we're trying to solve and, and the whole issues surrounding the DSA. Um, let me turn now, Imran, to you. I know that there's been a new research that, that CCDH has done called Malgorithm. Uh, I suspect the name says it all. But uh, give me your opening thoughts uh, on, on what way we should be looking at this right now. Thanks so much for that, and uh, good morning from Washington. Um, the Centre for Countering Digital Hate might not be familiar to you. Um, so here's who we are. We're an international not-for-profit uh, NGO, and our job, as we see it, is to disrupt the architecture by which hate and misinformation spread. Uh, not so much to analyze it. I think at this point, the situation analysis is pretty uniformly accepted. We have a problem. Um, and we study how actors, systems, culture combine to allow bad actors to use digital spaces to create harms. Um, part of our analysis and part of the way that we operate is that we have a very solid understanding of the architecture by which hate and misinformation are uh, proselytized and spread and then operationalized as well. So, for example, as Alex uh, Alexander mentioned, there are evidence points, fake news sites, which are designed to look like real news sites, but actually are designed to spread misinformation. There are spaces in which radicalization occurs using those evidence points, spaces like Facebook groups in particular, the comment sections, YouTube and other, uh, other places like that. And then there are discourse shaping tools. And what do I mean by that? I mean Twitter. There are spaces in which bad actors are able to use the tools afforded to them and to which they're given free access in order to create to, to, to create the sense of a popular um, support for their fringe beliefs uh, or their hateful beliefs. 
And we seek to disrupt them in every sense across all three of those platforms, whether it's the platforming work by exposing what they do and creating costs for social media companies for tolerating them. It's by showing how ads for uh, prominent and well-respected brands can appear and thereby fund those evidence points, those fake news sites that we talked about. That's one of our campaigns called Stop Funding Misinformation that's been incredibly successful in shutting down websites, including Voice of Europe, which was one of the leading far-right uh, uh, sites in, uh, in Europe. Um, and we work with practitioners in diverse fields. So we look at political science, but also behavioral psychology, neurology, the law, CV, counterterrorism, child protection. And we work across the UK, US, EU, and increasingly ANZ and other uh, territories as well. In the US, we've been established now for 10 months and we are, we're, we're, we're finding that there is an absolutely open space for someone talking the moral language of allowing this sort of uh, content to proliferate and profiting from it. So anyone that's in the UK may have watched the Channel 4 documentary last night, uh, which featured CCDH about the anti-vax industry and how that has been tolerated and in fact given sucker and energy by social media companies. So that's why we exist. In the last year, what we've done is spent most of our time looking at COVID-19, uh, the different types of actors involved in producing misinformation, whether it's hate actors who are seeking to instrumentalize misinformation to, uh, to, to, to advance claims that, for example, foreign origin citizens are responsible for the crisis. What we see mainly though is economically motivated actors, basically snake oil salesmen casting doubt on social authorities, telling us that the vaccines are dangerous, that COVID isn't real and that you can't trust doctors or governments in order to exploit the crisis and sell their own solutions. And we actually last night quantified in that documentary how much they make from those uh, sales. We look at fringe political actors and misinformed citizens are the other two types of spreading misinformation. And by looking at how misinformation is spread and understanding it in detail at an operational level, at a day-to-day, -day, how would I spread misinformation if I wanted to sp uh, sp spread this particular meme or idea? We have uh, used those, these insights to bolster pro-social forces. So we work with governments, with uh, NGOs and other and, uh, health authorities uh, a lot, doctors individually even, to help them understand how they can better message and get their message across, but also to disrupt hate actors. So let me give you one example of the disruption work would be a report that we put out two months ago called The Disinformation Dozen about how 12 individuals produce 65 percent of the misinformation about vaccines that spread on social media across um, Anglo uh, across uh, English-speaking uh, countries. We um, we got 12 attorneys general from the US to write to Facebook and Google asking for their deplatforming. We got the House Energy and Commerce Committee to ask Mark Zuckerberg directly why he hadn't taken those people down, Th these known actors, these known misinformation spreaders. Um, we got Senators Klobuchar and Warner to do so. In that two months, we've had a we've had of their 89 accounts they had on social media, these 12 people, 29 have been removed. We've had a 40% reduction in their followers. But you know what, there's 60% still up. And that shows the limitations of even an incredibly aggressively public and political um, intervention asking the companies to do the right thing. It's not enough. And the reason why is legislators and regulators have syst systematically, globally, voluntarily abrogated their fundamental duty to the general public to have levers that can solve these harms when they come along. Even when a pandemic came along and there was a parallel pandemic of misinformation, we didn't have enough powers to fix it. And that is what's so exciting about what's happening in Europe right now with the DSA. The DSA that, by the way, I know legislators in the US and uh, civil society in the US are looking to with great anticipation because they know that Europe has the capacity and the will to actually take action and also the economic clout to make a difference, um, something I, I wish my country realized as well. Um, let me talk very briefly about Malgorithm, um, I, which, which uh, Jennifer kindly introduced. Malgorithm is a very good example of a piece of work that, can, that, that tries to understand how do the algorithms really work. So Insta I mean, very simply, Instagram launched a new algorithm in August 2020. And it gave a to work out how does that work 
because what it did recommend posts underneath your feed, it used to say you've got to the end of your feed. Now it shows you recommended posts. We set up different accounts following different types of uh, uh, different cohorts of, of, of uh, uh, other accounts. So some following wellness, some following anti-vax, some following anti-Semites, some following um, QAnon. And we worked out what was being recommended to each. What we found is this, that if you're following wellness, it gives you anti-vax. So it was radicalizing people. We found that if you follow anti-vax, it was feeding you anti-Semitism and QAnon and vice versa. If you followed QAnon, it would give you anti-vax and COVID misinformation. We found the algorithm was actually deepening and then broadening the radicalization of people that engage with it. And that is incredibly dangerous. Now, Instagram's response to it was to say it's a small study. It was. Their other response was to say that it was old, that five months later they'd fixed it because, of course, it takes time to get a report out. Um, well, we'd actually found more, we found more recommendations the morning that we launched the report. And number 10 made the really good point to me when I talked to them about it, which is that Facebook and Instagram are pushing back on this very hard because there is a problem. And that's precisely why we need transparency on that algorithm, because there is clearly a problem there at launch. Perhaps it has gone away, but the only, the best people to work out if it has are government authorities, are independent public authorities. I mean, a, a point that Alexandra made very well herself. So we believe that, 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 that there needs to be a systemic, a, a sort of a reconfiguration of the levers available to us and of the transparency that we have of this sector. The DSA has some really powerful measures, clear paths for organizations like CCDH to tell platforms about illegal or personally harmful content. The rights of individuals to know why content is removed, which bolsters overall confidence in the freedom of speech that people enjoy on those platforms. The requirement for platforms to show users the identity of advertisers. Look, advertising is 98% of the revenues of Facebook and Google. It is the lifeblood of that industry. And it cannot be left in a black box. We need to have transparency in how billions, tens of billions of dollars are being generated and spent. And we support the DSA's proposed additional measures for very large online platforms, uh, charmingly named VLOPs. Uh, so platforms with more than 45 million users, such as the immediate removal and reporting of content that poses a systemic risk to human rights. And we know that systemic risks occur, whether it's the pandemic, it's the damage done to the US elections uh, confidence, it's um, genocide. And also the requirement for platforms to publish details about how their algorithms work to display content, because that is the great unknown that we really need to clarify. We also are very supportive of the requirement for platforms to monitor and report annually any systemic risks affecting them and for them to take steps using flaggers, moderation technologies and cooperation with other platforms to mitigate these risks. And finally, look, I've said before that the, it's the economics that really matter. We need to have better forensic understanding of the economics of these platforms and how, for example, Google, which has somehow managed to get away with positioning itself as being the great counter violent extremism funder for most of civil society. Most organizations like mine take money from Facebook or Google. And yet Google is the single biggest funder of misinformation on this planet in that its Google ad service will currently serve up ads from Procter & Gamble, Unilever, and a, a myriad other companies onto the websites of any content producer who's happy to be on their Google display network, and they're happy to take anyone on there. That's how Breitbart, Voice of Europe, Zero Hedge, uh, you know, climate denial blogs, um, how uh, blogs run by, uh, websites run by men who hate women, how a number of critical social and political imperatives are being undermined by the unrestricted flow of misinformation. Who is funding that industry? Primarily Google. And having transparency on where people's ads appear, not just for the public, so we can say, are you sure you want your ads appearing on the supporting site because I can't be your customer, but also for the advertisers themselves who all too often don't know. A very simple law forcing uh, Google to reveal where ads appear would be a game changing when it comes to misinformation spreading. We really would like to see innovative new proposals like that integrated into this uh, deliberation process. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Imran. Really, really appreciate that.
Barbara, let me turn to you now. Uh, tell us a bit about your, where you intersect with this discussion. Uh, thank you all for having me today uh, and for this important event. And I, I just wanted to mention, I think it is very important to collaborate uh, on this critical topic. It's long overdue in Europe, but also across the Atlantic. I agree with uh, Ahmed's vision uh, that there is a, a very strong uh, mutual interface and feeding of uh, misinformation across the Atlantic and within, within uh, of course, different language bubbles in Europe as well, which is quite effective. Uh, I'm the co-founder, I'm by training, I'm a pediatrician, pediatric infectious disease uh, specialist who's uh, worked in, in HIV and then uh, began working more and more on vaccination and also in acute respiratory viruses on my scientific, uh, wearing my scientific hat uh, over the past, I would say 12 years, which of course now made me uh, even more busy since last year, as you can imagine. Uh, so for the longest time, we've been working on uh, questions around pandemic preparedness and, and, and vaccination and, and vaccine safety. Uh, and I could talk forever about this, but the, the foundation of the Vienna Vaccine Safety Initiative indeed took place in Vienna after conference. We sat in a beautiful Viennese coffee house with a number of experts from different parts of the world, both uh, low and high resource settings, uh, scientists who work in the field, uh, medical anthropologists, risk analysis specialists, uh, linguists, uh, so not just medical experts. Uh, and we were all ranting about several vaccine introduction programs that had gone wrong uh, at the time, uh, both in, in, in uh, Europe and, and in, uh, in uh, certain developing countries as well. And we, we were all highly concerned, all of us with our specific geographic and professional slash scientific uh, hat. Uh, and I found that discussion so intriguing, and we're talking about 2008 here, uh, that I said, well, we might, you know, I have a long history in design thinking and, and, and think tank uh, workflows. I said, why don't we start a think tank on this particular topic to trigger uh, scientists to find a voice and to understand that they need to talk not only amongst each other and across disciplines, but also outside about these very important topics because of this polarization getting worse and worse. Uh, and we had no idea what we were talking about then compared to the situation now, as you can imagine. Uh, so this was all just in the very early days of vaccine disinformation. Uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, working at the, uh, at the big hospital academic institution in Berlin for a while, uh, then uh, beginning 2009. Uh, and we, with the former chair of pediatrics there, we co-founded the Vienna Vaccine Safety Initiative as a formal legal entity. So that's why we're based in Berlin and now also in the United States in New Orleans uh, with two uh, entities across the Atlantic. Uh, and we kept the name Vienna Vaccine Safety Initiative because this is where we initially began. Uh, so we started working together on a very scientific level, um, creating a, a whole uh, bunch of publications in the field that used a very strict think tank and collaboration mode in which we generate fresh thoughts from people from these different perspectives and then focus them like a laser on a topic and then create and sculpt the, the, the document that we're writing into coherent a uh, collaborative document, and that became quite appealing to a number of medical journalists uh, who then uh, asked us to, uh, to they commissioned uh, specific articles from us, etc. Uh, so this kind of started propelling itself forward and the momentum of what I lightheartedly said in a Viennese coffee shop in 2008 has moved forward massively. We've also worked on developing digital tools to improve the communication between physicians and patients, which we still consider some of the core elements of the discussion around vaccines. Uh, we did a design thinking project in Berlin with the School of Design Thinking at the Hasso Plattmann Institute, uh, so in, specifically on communication of vaccination. Even then, did we talk and write about the need to address digital disinformation, uh, that the algorithms are designed in a way that propels people forward, that triggers fear, that creates a sense of polarization that actually doesn't reflect the reality of the topic. It also creates the notion of experts not agreeing with each other. Uh, all of these things keep people engaged. 
uh, and, and sort of misperceiving the whole field of it. And, and if you are a practitioner in the field, so we started a vaccine communication clinic in Berlin at the time, where I just received uh, concerned uh, parents mostly uh, in a setting where I said up front, I'm doing this in my extra time. I'm not paid for this. All you need is a letter from your doctor that they're fine with us doing this. And I'll sit there and listen and I will hold that communication with you. I will hold that space for you. And again, even if you set up something like that, the need was bombastic. I could have done nothing else. But uh, even if you do that, people are so triggered by now that they expect you to take a side up front. And even though we're in a, in a rather fast debate here, I'm very abstract. A simple example is I, I took a ride from Berlin to Potsdam one morning uh, for vaccine CME, you know, continuing medical uh, education event for, for practitioners in the area. I was asked to speak there and that was because it was early on a Sunday morning uh, before the clubbing people come home. <laughs> I was sitting on that train with another woman and we just made some small talk and said, so what are you headed to Potsdam for? And she said, she's a Baroque cellist and she's going to play in a concert, et cetera. And I said, well, that's all beautiful. So what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to speak at a vaccine uh, event. Uh, and she said, oh, are you for or against it? You know, and, and that to me, uh, I remember that moment until today because that was so typical for me to understand that the most random person that you run into believes that there are only two positions towards vaccination and this is, this is gonna decide everything else going forward. And it hasn't gotten any better since. Uh, the Vienna Vaccine Safety Initiative had been commissioned or tendered to write uh, policy briefings for the European Parliamentary Research Service in fact, in 2019, uh, on the topic of uh, vaccination and also on the European health policy, uh, uh, health program. And uh, a lot of the things that we were talking about there, about grassroots innovation, about needing to have, so to say, boots on the ground and to work very closely with the actual communities, uh, has indeed uh, materialized or began to materialize. So we just launched a big project, which is coordinated by the Vienna Vaccine Safety Initiative looking at improving vaccine uptake in, in difficult to reach uh, and, and marginalized populations across Europe. Uh, this has just been started at the European Commission level with two other projects on, on difficult populations together last week. And we're working closely with the European Academy of Pediatrics and a number of other stakeholders and also involved in vaccine education to improve the information conveyed through healthcare professionals. Uh, we're working with the American Academy of Pediatrics, the International Pediatric Association, and the European uh, Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, so we are very, very involved in this interface. And um, I'm super interested in, in helping this moving forward because it's not just all you know my own ideas. I think a lot of this is the, the concert of this think tank that is so unique in its expertise and its in its uh, synergy here, this is a very powerful instrument for you to rely on when it comes to translating science and innovation into tangible outcomes uh, that hopefully improve what we deliver to patients. And, and that's the last few words that I wanted to say are my very first research interest in medicine, still while in medical school, were medical history and, and, and bioethics. And uh, I keep coming back to this topic throughout my career, not only when I'm part of an ethics committee at a hospital, et cetera, but also uh, in this aspect. Uh, I think we cannot underestimate the, the violation of the, the main principles of medical ethics in vaccine disinformation. We're talking about justice and equity, and we're talking about you know, the do no harm uh, ideas that are ancient and uh, we, we need to understand that if we are uh, distributing information, medical information, this is part of what we as physicians do and are accountable for, right? Uh, it can be part of a treatment, it can be part of prevention. I'm talking broader than vaccines here. And yet the only space that is more regulated is indeed uh, the moment when we decide to write a prescription. And maybe we have to rethink this uh, and also call physicians accountable here, uh, that if you as a physician distribute false information, 
because that is feeding to your clientele or you think you attract a certain kind of clients this way, you have a financial interest in, in doing harm. And, and these things are concerning. Uh, a lot of people do this uh, not knowingly, obviously. I'm not saying everybody has bad intentions, not at all. Most people have good intentions, but we need to think about that. Uh, medical information has an immediate impact on health. Not only the decision whether you vaccinate or not, but also a lot of other decisions uh, that we take in everyday life. Uh, so there is a question, and it is historically not new. Uh, if you look at the history of vaccines, for example, the space of, of physicians being able to advertise, uh, of, of specific medications being advertised, uh, there is a history, there is a blueprint for uh, an understood need to, to look at that on a regulatory side. And I do think that the, the industry that is behind uh, online information, to use a neutral term, is so vast by now that it warrants this kind of uh, neutral oversight uh, to a degree that we are not used to from the past. Uh, but we have blueprints, we have uh, an understanding in other areas. I understand that if I if I go out and and uh, and, and uh, in the street that I have to follow specific rules for traffic, um, you know there are other areas where we know very well uh, that we have rules to to live by to not harm other people in what we do, uh, and I hope that we can expand our horizons a little bit here and, and collaborate going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, now, Alexandra, I put you on the spot while they're asking about where the legislation is at right at the beginning. But I want to give you the chance now to reflect on what you've heard from both Imran and from Barbara, because they've been giving you know, real examples of what they're working on. Um, yeah, that, that was really inspiring. And I think one of the issues we are dealing with in the context of the DSA, and I a little bit would like to answer also, if you don't mind, one of the, the first question that came up in the Q&A, because I think that's really on the start, that says, um, if we mandate greater transparency and the algorithms, who would be the regulatory enforcement authority to prevent the default of pushing of harmful content? And I think that's one of the points um, that disinformation or misinformation, because you know, if more normal people just share posts that they find convincing or interesting, that's not disinformation, it's not illegal. And that puts us in a very different, difficult position as regulators, because um, we don't want to decide what is legal or what is not illegal. That's that's up for courts to do in, in in a you know in a in a rule of law state, um, so it's 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 really difficult to tackle on. And I really like what Barbara said as well. Um, and I think what is interesting here is science. I mean, science is progress. It's it's not it's not a fact. It's something. It's work in progress, basically. And um, therefore, I think it's very difficult or very dangerous. For, for states to decide what kind of content, what kind of post is, is legal and has to be taken down and what hasn't. And then coming back to the idea of enforcing decisions or what to do with that content, um, I think in, in terms of the DSA, we are, we are still at the beginning on how to deal with this kind of content that we think is harmful, definitively society, but it's not clearly illegal. It's not against the code. Um, and there, one point I would like to bring up is um, to have a stronger involvement of citizens. So in Europe, we have, um, we have a code of practice on disinformation, which is basically a code of practice that um, the, you know, the European Commission has set up together with major platforms and which the results of which are very controversial. So the commission is saying, well, it works. And, um, you know, I think normal citizens are seeing and we as experts are seeing this information really on the rise. So I'm, I'm not quite sure it works, but we should bring in citizens participation here because this is something you can't just leave to the platforms to regulate or to decide on privately because platforms have a very clear economic 
incentive, as, as Imran and me explained, to keep this information up and to keep polarizing content up and, and to increase it. So you can't leave it to the platforms to, to combat it. It doesn't make sense. They have a very strong incentive to have it there. Um, and you can't just leave it to the commission because in our idea of what a democracy is, you don't give government the option just to delete content and to decide what is what is lawful and what is not, that it doesn't fit. So I think one thing we could do is here on the codes of practice, which are being sort of codified in the DSA, because until now there was no legal basis for having this code of practice. Um, it's a self or co-regulatory instrument. And I think here we could bring in citizens participation, for example, in the form of citizens council, which have been very successful in Ireland, in France to, to deal with very controversial issues and to have them, for example, look at the results of transparency, organi um, transparency um, provisions. We also have that provision that, that's article 31 for the DSA nerds um, that gives access to academia, to the data in order to, to be able to study how the algorithms work. Um, and to have to look, or to, to look at those results, to look at the results of the code of practice and to make further suggestions to create a public debate because at times, um, as the work that Imran is doing, um, convincing companies to pull out their advertising from those websites, for example, just all, at times already having a public debate and reflecting very publicly on those practices causes some companies to change their behavior. And I think that's one point. Second point is the Citizens Council could make policy recommendations to policymakers in order to step in further with legislation. But in order to do that, we have to have some evidence. And so far, we only have some anecdotal evidence or like algorithm, which is a great, great thing, but it's, it's a small piece. So it's not enough to regulate and to decide what to do. So I think we first have to get more transparency, take out the financial incentive and then bring out citizens more because they often make very, very wise decisions. And maybe one last point, which is not on the DSA yet, but in the DMA, that is a parallel legislative initiative um, on, on markets, um, we should have more interoperability because at a certain point, if people have the possibility to leave Facebook or Instagram and to go to different social networks with terms of service that say we are very clearly enforce um, our terms against this information, I think people, when they have the transparency and know what's going on, they're going to leave the platform that fosters this information and go to a platform where they find more information and less polarizing content. So that is something else. We, we really, really need more interoperability in order to give other platforms, new platforms with different kinds of, of policies um, to, to stand a change in this market and to find customers. Well, I think speaking about the code of practice, even the commission doesn't think it's that great because in their annual reports, they, they always say, well, more needs to be done. This isn't working very well. I mean, it is worth noting with regard to the code of practice that there were civil society representation in the original high level stakeholder groups that were setting it up. Um, but to my knowledge, it was very much set up in a very confrontational way where people were upset. Also, it was reporters against media, against big platforms. It was it was a very um, polarized way of approaching disinformation from the very beginning that I don't think has been rightly resolved in that, practice. That, I think part of why uh, sort of what we're trying to interface here, I think is, is really important. Number one, obviously you all know that uh, the most trusted sources of information are still healthcare professionals for vaccine information. Uh, secondly, uh, the science that I'm talking about, uh, I'm a little bit more relaxed about it in a way because the vaccines are not new at all. And uh, a lot of the basic uh, premises that are you know, being debated in some of these polarizing websites are very clear on the scientific side. There's no doubt and it's not going to change. Uh, so I think the, the, in, the science informed content uh, is, is not as easy to localize. Uh, often heard parents and citizens and we work also very closely with patient organizations and parent organizations, actually so closely that we made them their direct partner in our EU consortium, for example, rather than just a stakeholder. Uh, and we've written extensively on whether we're hearing the patient voice in the vaccine debate at all and, and what needs to change in order to do better. 
um, and this can be going into detail of you know physician uh, consultations being more educated and, and and more valued and reimbursed uh, so that these kinds of consultations can take the time they need <clears throat> and people aren't pushed to uh, alternate providers who cash in uh, uh, sidetracking the medical insurance system or whatever the healthcare system uh, and then are free to talk uh, for a lot of money as long as they want uh, so there is also that that concern that i think we've seen in the medical practice but uh, science is broad and, and uh, we've worked with, uh, you know, our, our 10 year anniversary was celebrated with two panels with the Society for Risk Analysis, which is a completely different world. There are people who work on, on environmental risks, on financial risks, on, on uh, all kinds of risks that you can imagine. And we're sitting there thinking, hey, there's something we can learn on vaccine risk uh, analysis and management and communication from, from other areas. Uh, that have their own scientific tools and methods and journals and worlds. Uh, and, and to me, this has been a fantastic journey from the very beginning to learn that social scientists and, and uh, you know, risk analysts and, and medical uh, mathematical modelers and IT cybersecurity experts, all these people have a lot to offer uh, in, in know-how that we don't and can't have. And that is what we hear from the patient and, and uh, so, sort of the civic society uh, representatives a lot. Is this, it's really an, un, um, at the core of this uh, is a sense of discomfort. Uh, a discomfort with an increasingly complex world of expertise that uh, is out there difficult to penetrate and and of course we all have very smart and intelligent friends and if you happen to work on respiratory viruses and vaccines you cannot imagine how many emails and, and and messages i get every day from you know friends who are highly specialized and educated in other areas let's say it let's say uh, physics let's say something else you know who who are not uh, naive and who are not uh, malignant, but who are trying to understand the scientific article that somebody shared on Twitter or something, uh, and and they have the 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 uh, sort of the background general academic training to understand how these things come to be. They even sometimes identify mathematical errors in a medical article, but they don't have the twenty years of training in critically appraising literature which is something that only a very small subsection of medical professionals have ever received. Uh, and, and that is, uh, you know, so there's a lot that has to be changed. And the COVID pandemic has made this blatantly obvious that on the surface, uh, scientific articles are readily available. On the surface, just looking at their headlines, they may contradict each other, which is the normal process of the Hegelian way of how we propel knowledge forward. Uh, and that creates a, a, an extrapolation of that sense of discomfort. And we, we as physicians have to be fully aware of that and understand that we in other areas have that same feeling. If somebody talks to me about nuclear power reactor safety, you know, I feel a sense of discomfort, but I'm saying, well, I hope that the people who are dealing with this professionally know what they're doing, right? So there's this kind of having to rely on other people who have an inside knowledge that I may only partially be able to, to obtain, or I may obtain it partially, not even be aware how partial that is. Uh, and that is the space that we find particularly challenging on the psychological level beyond the, the exploitation of that for commercial purposes, which clearly is uh, geared towards emotional engagement with content. And also, and that's something, a last comment that I wanted to make, I found very uh, concerning as a medical ethics and medical science person, as when we first discussed uh, specific organizations that were using academic knowledge of psychological analysis in order to uh, investigate political will, for example, or how that is formed. Uh, and you can pick any topic you like. What I found most outrageous about it, and it wasn't discussed as much, I believe, is that there was no informed consent on the side of the participants in that kind of research. Right, so you were just an involuntary participant because you were using your Facebook as you do every day 
Uh, and uh, without you knowing, people did in-depth psychological analysis of who you are, what makes you tick. They were, they were proud to be better than your family and your friends and knowing you. And there was never a debate about whether and how much I as a citizen have to provide an informed consent into this. And I know Europe has, has gone some steps forward to, to respond to this crisis, but I'm, I'm not sure if we're completely at the end of that debate yet, because there is... Uh... I'm going to cut you off, Barbara, because you, you, you've raised so many issues that I'm going to have to try and draw quite a few strands yeah. together <laughs> in order to try and package it up to, to put my questions to Imran as well. Um, I would say I think it depends where you are with regard to that debate. Those of us who followed the GDPR for decades had this discussion, so it very much depends which silos sure. of expertise you're in, which comes back again to what you're saying. Well, I mean the public debate, not the, not the expert debate, of course. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, obviously you're talking about emotional um, trust questions here. And while what I'm saying now is that, although for years I had total trust in medical professionals, I never felt so nervous about getting a vaccine as I did a couple of weeks ago. And I've traveled, you know, Cambodia and I've had all these vaccines and it never bothered me. So it has an effect, no matter how much I think we like to feel we're immune to it. Um, there's that sort of residual nagging doubt that is very clearly, as, as the words that uh, Alexandra used at the beginning, that we are triggered. Now, what I want to ask Imran is why? Because you can see the financial incentive for platforms. They're getting money from the advertising revenue and the more clicks, the more eyeballs, the more they can charge and so on. But what about the actual sources of the disinformation? I mean, you've done a lot of research in this, and I know that, for example, a lot of the disinformation in Europe comes from Russia. So I'm hesitant about pushing technological solutions on cultural problems. So I know we say follow the money, but with disinformation of this sort on vaccines, is it a follow the money case? Or is there some other agenda, be it political, be it nihilist, that is simply at work here in your, in your research, Iman? So, I mean, at a really simple level, misinformation spreads and is accepted most readily when people are in a state of, of, of epistemic uncertainty, when they don't just not know what's true or not, but they don't know how to find what's true or not. And I mean, I think let's leave aside for a second that there are lots of people in academic elites who perhaps are passing through papers on Twitter and they want some help with it. The majority of the people, and let's keep in mind that tens of millions of people across our countries are rejecting vaccines or are hesitant about vaccines, about the COVID vaccine right now. In the US, for example, the cohort with the highest, uh, with the lowest vaccine uh, intention rate are basically poorly educated white Republican voters. Um, uh, we've, you, we've had a problem with African American communities, Latinx communities as well, and a huge amount of work has been done there. So this which, is actually, which, if this, I may interject, is very different from the research we've done over decades on where the biggest vaccine hesitancy were the most educated people, in fact. So uh, we need to see how that evolves. <laughs> you know, so it, it's it's maybe unique about uh, this particular pandemic uh, politicization. Uh, maybe I don't know what your thought is around on that. So perhaps the reason for that is that this has been a perfect experiment this past year and what would happen if the information exchange mechanisms for our society were designed by Mark Zuckerberg and ran to the rules of Facebook. Um, and of course, what that's meant is that misinformation actors have been able to rule the roost because algorithms we know promote that which is controversial and that which is engaging over that which is perhaps factual or useful. And we've had limited ability to actually to speak to those people that we might normally use as checks and balances. But if the vaccine hesitancy rate for measles was the same as it is for COVID, we're in real trouble across all of our societies. I mean, real trouble. And, and COVID itself is, of course, see, a, a very serious problem. Tens of thousands of people will undoubtedly die as a result of the slowing down of, of, the, of, of, the, of the moment at which we reach that herd immunity rate across our society. So there is, there, is, there is a price paid in lives for the misinformation that's spread unabated on these platforms. The reason why misinformation is able to spread at such speed is because the marginal cost of each additional communication to each additional person is zero. And when that happens, it forces us to reconsider the balance between people being able to use these platforms with, you know, as freely as they wish to, to be able to, these private platforms, which are profit-making, and 
the harm principle as well. I think someone mentioned, you know, the, the question, the philosophical question of freedom of speech versus harm. Well, we don't have to create new ideas on this. You can go back to John Locke and look at the way that he talked about the harm principle being the vitiating factor when it comes to freedom of speech. We actually already have a philosophical framework for the configuration of those rights. And I mean, as I frequently say to my colleagues in the US, the First Amendment might be the freedom of speech, but the first and most fundamental right is the right to life. Um, it's just the First Amendment to the Constitution, which is often you know, f f forgotten or, or misunderstood. I think that what's been very clear to me speaking today is that there is a desperate need for data and transparency that we've failed, I think, to gather the data at a systemic level and use central authorities, whether it's government, the European Union, uh, or other, other forms of authority to act as a, as, as a commissioner of, of data gathering at the scale and speed that we need, especially about platforms that operate at, in, you know, at a velocity that we're not used to, and that allow for the transmission of and the creation of new harms at a velocity that we're not used to. But also, um, also about convening civil society more effectively. I do think that we're far too fragmented as civil society. And the DSA's capacity to act as an anchor point, not just legally, but also emotionally, also as a convening tool for broader civil society and global authorities as well. I know the US is interested. I know ANZ is interested, the UK and other countries as well. But this process will be looked at by lots of other countries. Um, I think it's desperately important that we understand that we are dealing with companies that don't that will not move on their own. So I mean, someone asked a question about whether or not uh, an, an industry code would be sufficient, a voluntary industry code. Let me tell you what's happened with with anti vaccine disinformation, disinformation that we know kills. Last year in September, Mark Zuckerberg told Axios that he would not take down vaccine disinformation because he didn't think it contravened his platform's own standards, their community standards. By Christmas, we put out a report called the Anti-Vax Playbook. So we, we went into a, a meeting of the world's leading anti-vaxxers and we recorded what they said for three days. And in that, they, they laid out their, their plan. It was really simple. Persuade people that vaccines are dangerous, COVID isn't dangerous, that you can't trust doctors, and do that using a variety of techniques, including turning the internet into a, into a massive answering space. Can I come back so, to the question, why, Imran, why? <laughs> Because they can make money out of it. Look, if you can persuade people not to take a vaccine and tell them that instead they should take your product, quercetin, hydrochloroquine, uh, um, nebulized H2O2, that's one of the, the world's biggest anti vaxxer is worth $100 million by his own estimation. Uh, Joe that, McCullough. That, I he's think just, it's, it's really, he's just, so we're getting to the interface again between regulatory authorities around medicinal products and see, see what, I'm, what I'm saying here and the, the disinformation, that there is more linkage than I agree with you, Imram, that is, is of critical importance. Because if, this... if, I think that you know, if we give advice that is wrong, what is the advice we're giving instead and where does that lead? That part of the story uh, needs to be explored and communicated a lot further. Uh, because yes, that is sort of the exception of, of trying to be a bit balanced here and who has speaking time. Imran, yeah. please, please continue your, your point. So, I mean, the point being that uh, at Christmas, they changed their policy as a result of the, of, of, of the uh, outroar over the, 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 the anti-vax playbook to say that they would ban misinformation. We put out the disinformation dozen showing that 12 individuals are responsible for 65, the AGs, the senators, the Congress people write to them. They said, they said again, uh, a month later to Senate Judiciary that they'd take an action. As of right now, the action they've taken using their voluntary code to enforce their own rules on the, they now say that disinformation that may lead to loss of life about vaccines is not permitted. They say super spreaders will be taken down. And yet the super spreaders, are all still up on at least one platform. The truth is that voluntary standards and holding them to account for how they even enforce their own rules isn't good enough. The Facebook oversight board is, I mean, almost ludicrously ineffective. And I mean, sadly has consumed some great European politicians' reputations as well uh, in doing so, because what it's become is a cover for the lack of action. And all of it is designed to do one thing, 
to stave off the moment when a government has the guts to actually regulate and to say, we will hold you accountable when there are identifiable harms, when they contribute in your own standards and you fail to act. Because at that point, you become morally culpable as much as the originator of the misinformation or hatred for the offline harms that it creates. I cannot commend enough the EU for, for, for being so far advanced and have, having by far the most, um, the, the most sophisticated and broad set of proposals on this. And I mean, having this debate today. So thank you very much. Uh, well, let's see where we end up, because uh, if you know anything about EU legislative process, it doesn't happen overnight. And there's always the, the situation we get the Commission proposal, goes to the Parliament, they try to fix it, some people try to make it worse, and then we end up with the whole thing going to Council and some member states, some governments will push back. It's, it's, it's you know, you can, you, can, it's, you can sing the hymn sheet before we even start. So you answered quite a few of those questions that were coming up. Thank you very much, Imran, in your, in your comments. Someone was asking whether the Facebook court was any good at taking down uh, harmful content. I think you clearly answered that. We also asked a question about whether a code of practice might be good enough. I think probably we know your opinion on that. Um, Alexandra, let me come back to you because um, Paul McDonnell has made an observation that when the DSA talks about systemic risk, uh, we, we seem to believe it means disinformation because of the effect of disinformation will be a systemic risk. Um, and I wanted to ask you this as well. How do you feel that um, relates to, we, we have concerns about democracy, security, but this is in the area of public health. Can we learn anything about how to approach the current wave of disinformation um, from what we've learned about, if you like, electoral law and, and these other sorts of rules we have about transparency and advertising or political funding. Um, just because I can see a certain parallel between the two and I wonder whether you think lessons could be learned from other bits of legislation, either at national member state level or at EU level that could be brought to bear in the DSA. Um. I'm not sure about that. I mean, as you mentioned, the code of practice on disinformation has not been particularly successful. So I think what we are learning there is what, what Imran said, that we need further regulation and we need to enforce it, especially. I think one thing we can learn from GDPR, for example, that when you have rules, you need to enforce them. And that's a point where um, I see a weakness in the DSA. I think there was a question more or less about that because I mentioned the independent agency just to maybe to explain that in the DSA. So far, the governance of the DSA is more on a national level in the sense that you have digital services coordinators in, in each single European country who would be sort of the first responders. And, um, a strong role for the Irish Digital Service Coordinator in practice because most the big tech is usually headquartered in Ireland. And then it eventually, after a series of, of complicated procedures, um, it goes back to, to the commission. And I think that is something that's probably not what you had in mind now, Jennifer, but it's something I've been thinking about quite a lot, how the enforcement of the DSA could work, because I think there's nothing worse than having a good law with bad enforcement, because people will get tired of it. And this is what we are seeing in GDPR, that it's very well enforced, which is a data protection legislation in Europe, maybe for our American um, participants. Um, that is very well enforced against national company, companies where enforcement is a national task, but very badly against the global players who had quartered in Ireland, which is a very small country and a big share of the Irish economy is dominated by big tech. Um, so there, there's a lack of credibility because people feel that, I think Barbara mentioned that, well, how can they use the psychological test on Facebook and people have never given their informed consent? Well, they should be, I mean, they, they, they should have the option to give informed consent. It's just that these rules are not being enforced against Facebook the way they are being enforced against every local kid's soccer club for a soccer club, for example, you know, that, that's really an issue. So this is one thing we need to avoid. And I think the, the enforcement structure in the DSA is not sufficient so far. There's a European board, it's very complicated. 
And I think at least um, for the part that concerns the auditing of the social network, the auditing of the risk assessments, which are done by the companies themselves, so the private sector itself, and they don't have any interest to, to say, well, our financial model, our business model is a systemic risk to human rights. They're, they're never going to say that. It's the same logic as Imran mentioned on the Facebook oversight board. Um, I mean, it's a joke. It's, if it's appointed by the company itself, it's never, it's always going to, to concentrate on maybe marginal factors that can be improved, but it's, it's never going to put into question the business model itself. Um, and and that's why, why I think we need, we need better enforcement. And do you think there's a role for civil society there um, in, in pushing um, companies to act? I mean, you know, I think you, what your point was sort of making is turkeys don't vote for Christmas. They're, they're, they're making a lot of money for something that's not in their interest. But I'm just wondering, given the imbalance between NGOs, civil rights organizations and so on, is there any way that they could work with platforms to encourage them to change? I mean, or do we really fundamentally believe that legislative, regulatory, enforcement with teeth is absolutely necessary? Well, I think regulation with teeth is necessary. I mean, Google, Facebook, and, and big tech is spending 50 million on lobbying in Brussels every year. And we see that as legislators and the commission sees that. And you can't, I mean, I really don't doubt the good intentions of the commission, but on some points, especially the ones I'm focusing on, which are quite controversial, like, like ad tech, for example, you can listen to the commission repeating the arguments that the lobbyists of those companies have told me. And that's, I mean, it's just so ubiquitous, the kind of lobbying they do. And I'm not saying that they're, they're extremely professional. They have extremely good people there. Imran mentioned some European politicians. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's that's an imbalance that cannot be overcome. I mean, NGOs don't have that kind of money. They don't have that kind of time. They, they can't be in every meeting. Um, there's just no way. So if we bring civil society in, we have to do that with the support of regulation, with adequate means, and with a good methodology. You know, this is not about having a random NGO having their say. This is about creating a structure um, of bringing citizens in a very representative structured way. And we have a lot of precedent there as in France, as in Ireland, even in Germany, we have had citizens council who have taken very wise decision on extremely controversial issues like on abortion in Ireland, um, on climate change in France and are pushing um, changes that nobody would have expected to be socially acceptable, but they are. So I think we have a very important role in our democracies and we see that I think you see that in Washington even worse, but we see that in Brussels very strongly because we have the commission, so government more or less on one side and legislators who spend a lot of their time listening to companies and then you have the private sector and normal citizens, which are actually the users of those platforms are completely left out. And I'm, I'm a great fan of representative democracy and I absolutely don't want to go into that rhetoric that, that the European Union is not democratic enough but in this case, where you have a handful of large platforms and um, state authorities trying desperately to deal with them, but still being very influenced with revolving doors and so on, I think you have to bring in citizens in a different ways. And I don't want to do that on illegal content, because really, you have this point between distinguishing between illegal content and, and harmful content. It's a very tight rope to walk on. Um, but I think we need a role for, for civil society here. And Citizens Council would, would be a great way to do that, to, you know, to look at trans transparency results, to give policy recommendations, to look at the codes of practice, which are not particularly transparent, especially the results and so on. And I think that might change something in the future, yes. Well, thank you. And you've touched on some of the things. We're, we're getting towards the end of our time. And I know we've jumped around a lot on different points because it's just such a vast topic to try and cover in this length of time. Um, I'm looking through the questions. Eileen Cullity asks about the Ireland's Data Protection Commission. Eileen, I would love to talk to you all day about that. Unfortunately, I don't think it's within the scope of this afternoon. And um, I, I think I like Claire Melford's question here um, at the end, Imran, maybe for you. How can we use the momentum that that's been generated to deal with the online anti-vax content to encourage platforms to deal with all anti-science content and things like climate denial. Um, I know, I know, obviously, countering hate is in is, is in your title there, but what other areas do you think you know need to be leveraged this moment for? 
Well, I, 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 first of all, hi, Claire. Uh, Claire runs the uh, GDI, which is a fantastic organization which produces data on how advertising is funding uh, misinformation of all types. And, and, and the, the, the fundamental breakdown in that market um, and I cannot uh, commend the work of her organization enough. And she's right, look, there is this big question of how we take the energy and the, the visibility. I think 2020 proved one point. I no longer get asked by journalists, is there an offline, you know, this is, is this just online or is there you know, an offline part to this as well? Because whether it's the riots in the capital down the road from me or it's the pandemic and vaccine misinformation, we know that there is a cost. And that cost is born in lives uh, loss, unfortunately. And so that th we have an opportunity now to also apply some of the same findings and the same understanding, the same energy, the same mobilization around combating disinformation and building statutory mechanisms, powerful mechanisms by which we can force transparency, but also hold accountable executives. Um, I think we can carry that through to what is an extinction level threat to the species, which is climate change. Um, so if we, you know, if we can do it for, for, for vaccines and for COVID, we should be able to do it for something which has the potential to, to, to change the absolute nature of life itself on this planet. So, you know, I would hope so. I mean, I think to, to speak to the point that Alexandra makes as well, that, you know, part of the, of the job of civil society is to make itself redundant. I, I, I hope to, you know, that I can not do this job in a few years time. And that this is, that governments have stopped abrogating their duty and have taken back controls, have arrogated to themselves the ability to make, to, to hold these companies and, and platforms accountable because all my job at the moment is to identify the harms caused by the lack of control that we have and it affects everything whether it's identity-based hate it's misogyny it's climate change denial it's uh, vaccine denial but a whole range of issues and they are being undermined by the the, the unrepentant flow of misinformation and the ability of malignant actors to use social media to create offline harms. So I think that this is, you know, we're gonna to have to create a lot of noise in civil society, but I do hope at some point we can hand over the reins to people like Alexandra. Absolutely, we all look forward to you being out of a job, Imran. <laughs> um, Barbara, uh, there's a question here from a French attendee um, that I think you were going to answer. Does Barbara think the COVID-19 pandemic and especially the race for the vaccine internationally, has led to much reduced vaccine hesitancy. Um, has there been a flip side? Has there been uh, people more interested? And I'd also maybe if you could also address the different, are you seeing different people feeling hesitant now than were before? That's what I was about to say. I think, uh, you know, uh, for example, we, as, as many European MEPs, and I'm sure Alexandra is fully aware, is, We've had vast measles outbreaks in Europe uh, that are not harmless. Measles has long-term consequences, sometimes 10 years later, on the health of children. Uh, that may be a bill to pay uh, later, uh, etc. So uh, we have had this issue. And uh, what, what I found interesting about COVID, I think there are different phases. And for those of you who remember the flu pandemic, uh, in 2009, uh, there were some little lessons uh, to be learned that were, weren't learned enough on the, I think, on the side of civil society and, and, and vaccine and democracy. Uh, and, and I think we, we need to understand there's a lot of very interesting psychological and social science research in the background of this. Uh, I think you mentioned, Jennifer, earlier, you know, you don't have a problem when you travel on, on your vacation to uh, Cambodia, I think you mentioned, or, you know, uh, uh, you know you, you'll get your vaccine and you'll go. Uh, uh, yet, when you have to decide voluntarily if you expose yourself to the COVID vaccine, there's a different uh, Kopfkino, as we say in German, different movie going on in your head, right? Uh, and I think that uh, is, is, is a very well-known example to people in risk analysis in the vaccine uh, field, uh, that the perception of something being voluntary versus not, uh, the perception of something being the pharmaceutical industry versus natural, uh, there, there's a vast story that I can't go into detail, but there's a whole uh, background that, that is sort of like a cloud in people's mind where they say, yeah, that seems familiar to some other area in life where I've been forming this or that opinion, right? 
So whether you expose yourself voluntarily to a vaccine because your overarching goal is to have a beautiful summer vacation, or whether you uh, expose uh, your, your child to something that you perceive as artificial as opposed to the natural disease that is all great, uh, you know, that, that these are things that uh, led to in-depth research that is quite interesting uh, into the human mind and the way we, we do decision-making. Uh, and I think the, 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 the importance of what Imram said about the health, the, the right to life, the right to health, uh, the, the going back to the basic needs of the, the citizen and wants of the citizen is, is of utmost importance. And that's why I think design thinking was such a good tool for us because it puts the end user at the center of everything we do. And if you look at some of the European surveys that have been done in recent years, a Eurobarometer on vaccination, but also some on the political wishes that European citizens, for example, have, and what do they expect from the European Commission? The concept of safety from, you know, external threats, uh, be it political or, or military or terrorism, were very high up there, but one of the top needs was health. And I don't think we've exploited that new understanding enough yet in the sense of putting action into place that makes this uh, sort of serves this need, but also understands that there are expectations that citizens have of the European uh, body, uh, sometimes poorly understanding the, the, the legal situations and the small mandate that the Commission has with regards to health, right? A lot of the power lies still with the member states, and that is not known to the citizens. So I think we need to um, put these groups together with COVID. I think we're going through different phases of vaccine understanding. The first rollout is sort of a mixed bag of uh, trying to get access quickly to something that seemed uh, privileged um you know because of a perceived scarcity and the psychological drive of saying you know i i uh i'm very educated so maybe this is not for me maybe this is more for people who who need that kind of uh help uh, because if i get sick i have access to top line medical uh you know uh, supplies and medical care uh, that may have been a little bit disrupted by covid because of the scarcity of beds the the issues with icus the the prioritization that had to happen there i think that rattled some of the uh, more uh, wealthy population started to worry whether if they get sick they really will receive what they thought they would uh, years prior when we're talking about let's say influenza so uh, you know there's a lot going on here i think the COVID vaccine as it will move into something more uh, persistent or permanent possibly with maybe boosters etc going forward i think we'll see more of what we've seen with other vaccines before uh, the, the, you know, the more educated population strata and the more well-off population strata being sometimes the most vaccine resistant, uh, the, uh, I think we may end up with that pattern down the road. Thank you. Well, thank you, Barbara. I certainly do not envy you the job you have on your hands at the moment to be looking at vaccine hesitancy since 2008, to be still doing it in 2021, I'm sure is no joke at all. But thank you very much for your input, Iman. I'm fascinated. I had a lot of questions I wanted to ask you as well as, as the audience questions that we didn't get time to get near. So apologies for that. And I'm, hopefully we'll be able to have another one of these events someday soon. Again, thank you very much to the Centre for for countering digital hate, um, for, for, for organizing this event. And I'm going to urge people who aren't familiar perhaps in Europe to go to the website and, and check out the work that's being done at counterhate.com. Alexandra, I am sure we will talk much more about the DSA in the coming months. Again, it's your job to make sure we get to the right law in the end, uh, you and your colleagues. So good luck and good fortune in doing that. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. Let's try and keep this conversation going on socially. We've got, we can share each other's uh, details and contact each other through the evil beasts of social media, should we want to, in order to have conversations about how we can make them a good space and a commons for us to actually talk in, rather than a place where we share hatred or disinformation. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day.